This will be the first, but certainly not the last, lecture in this series about Japanese painters and paintings. Although my own specialty as a scholar has been Chinese painting, I spent a great deal of time in Japan, learned the language fairly, to speak it fairly fluently. I loved the country and its culture, and I did important research and writing about Japanese painting, especially uh, that school of artists called Nanga or Bunjenga. The words are used more or less interchangeably. Nanga means southern school, uh, uh, southern school painting, and Bunjenga is the Japanese reading for Wonrenhua or literati painting, scholar amateur painting. The school is made up of artists who, in one way or another, were emulating and trying to be the Japanese counterparts of the literati painting in China. So, if my feelings about literati painting in China have turned rather negative, why am I so enthusiastic about a school of painters who wanted to be the Japanese equivalents? That's a complex question, now, no easy answer. But the quick answer to it would be that because the Japanese could never become really like the Chinese literati artists, and because their failure in this respect was, in my view, their salvation, largely because they didn't have good models to look at or good Chinese teachers to teach them, they never really learned to paint in the literati styles to a degree that would have pleased the Chinese scholar artists. And because they never did, they came to make up a school of, that I find more interesting and more admirable for the most part than anything going on in China in the same late period, that is the later 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. So the first images, please. What to suggest that you read? Well, with my usual immodesty, I'll send you off to a work of my own, the 1972 catalog of the exhibition I organized for Asia House Gallery in New York. It was later shown at our University Art Museum in Berkeley, titled Scholar Painters of Japan, the Nanga School. The story of that exhibition, why it went badly wrong for a time, but was saved and took place, but with a selection of paintings quite different from my original choices, this story is told in one of the papers on my website, Reminiscence Number 50, my partly botched Nanga exhibition about how it was almost canceled thanks to a Japanese scholar friend who promised much but failed to deliver, and how it was saved by an old friend, the remarkable collector of Japanese art, someone known to everybody in Japanese art, that is, Mary Griggs Burke. Great person. Uh, next, please. Here is a photo of another old friend, Barbara Ford, longtime curator of Japanese art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, now retired. When I first contemplated doing this lecture, I wrote to four or five colleagues in Japanese art, asking whether they could help me with information and documentation on the three albums that are the main subjects of this lecture. And the one of them who really came through with things I really needed was Barbara Ford. So thank you, Barbara. Later, I was able to get from the archive in my name at the Freer Gallery, a copy of the notes for my first lecture given there in 1957 in which two of the three albums were principal subjects. But Barbara Ford's help has been crucial to this lecture, and I dedicate it to her. Next, please. This photo, which I've shown before, of the Met's earlier curator, Alan Priest, seen here with John Pope and Harry van der Stappen. I insert this to replace the photos I should have made in the year I spent as a museum scholarship student at the Met, uh, much of it sitting in Priest's office. I don't have the photographs, and this will have to do to remind us of remind me of that year. Next, please. I do seem to have one photo from that scholarship year, and it's an odd one. I was recruited by the then director, Francis Henry Taylor, and others to serve as a knight in armor at an annual fundraising event, a children's party at their great medieval art adjunct, the Cloisters. Uh, Taylor, Francis Henry Taylor, was King Arthur for the day. I was one of his knights, seen here helping one of the young visitors get himself photographed as another of the knights of the round table. Next. Another in this series of barely relevant photos shown for the person at far left. I'll show it again another time to introduce the shabby crew seen here with him, not now. This was made in 1973 or so, 
when Masao Ishizawa had become the director of the Yamato Bunkakan, the museum and collection located near Nara. Uh, this photo was made on their outdoor balcony. Uh, but I knew him first, Masao Ishizawa, when he came as the head of a delegation accompanying the great exhibition of Japanese painting and sculpture sent by the government of Japan and shown at the Met in 1953 to 4 when I was a fellowship student there. You can read about this exhibition on my website in Reminiscence number 50 and in a book by Warren Cohen cited there. Next. There were lots of good things in that exhibition, but the ones that were entirely new to me and that really bowled me over were the paintings by Nanga artists, in particular an album by Uragami Yokudo titled Enkajo, or Album of Mists and Clouds. My slides of that, which I showed and talked about many times over the years, have disappeared, and I can only show this bad black and white made from my Nanga catalog of one leaf. Anyway, I resolved after seeing these and getting so excited about them, I resolved to spend time searching out Nanga paintings and studying them when I went to Japan next, which I did in the following year, 1954, as a Fulbright student. Here's a photo of myself taken in Kyoto, soon after my arrival, with two friends who were also spending the year in Japan, Bill Watson at left and Jan Fontaine in the center. Next. And in addition to all the collectors to whom Shimada Shujiro took me to see their paintings, the dealer, Mayoyama Junkichi, whom I knew already from his visits to the Freer Gallery and from a chance meeting we had in New York and going around New York together. Uh, Mayoyama arranged viewings for me in Japan with collectors whom he knew. And one of these, we arrive at last at the climax of my story, next please, one of these was none other than the famous novelist Kawabata Yasunari at his house in Kamakura. He was the owner of several Chinese paintings, a great Gyokudo winter landscape that will be principal subject of a subsequent lecture, and two of the three albums that this lecture is mainly about. I saw them, admired them, but didn't have time then to photograph them completely. And after my return to Kyoto, I talked with him by phone and asked whether I could come back to photograph them. He agreed, and I not only returned to his house to photograph all the leaves of the albums, but, next please, he and his wife put me and my then wife, Dorothy, up for the night. Uh, his wife made skiaki for us that being the Japanese dish that all Japanese know that foreigners like. And I was able to talk with Kawabata for a long time. That was the beginning of a friendship that went on for some years. Through his visit to the U.S. in the Freer Gallery, where I showed him paintings, meetings again in Japan, a meeting in Taipei, shortly after he had been awarded the Nobel Prize, until shortly before his death by suicide. All this is the subject of another reminiscence on my website number 44. You can read about it all there. The two albums, anyway, that I mostly wanted to photograph completely at his house were the two that are the main subjects of this lecture, the so-called Ju Benjugi, albums by Ikeno Taiga and Yosa Buson. These two are national treasures. It was a rare and wonderful pleasure to be able to make slides from them at the home of their distinguished owner. Next. On my return to uh, Washington, D.C. in the Freer Gallery in 1956, after my year in Japan and travels in Europe, I gave at the Freer my first public lecture titled Painting Albums in China and Japan, about these two albums and one other by Hua Yen that the Freer had recently purchased. I repeated that lecture, apparently, I'd forgotten this, for the Chinese Art Society in New York in 1957. I was reminded of my lecture in New York by this handout, which was sent to me by David Hogg, who heads the Freer Gallery's archive, after I wrote him asking for notes for my old lecture. Um, also lecturing in their series, as I can see on this handout, are Madeleine David, whom I came to know in Japan when she came there to see Buddhist art, and again in, when I visited Paris, and Joseph Campbell, whom I never knew, but whom I thought of as an adversary, uh, he was an advocate of a Kumara Swami-like doctrine by which all Asia was one and all Asian art essentially religious. I was there when he advised a symposium audience that in order to understand Asian art, 
We should all study yoga. I was a committed opponent of that kind of thinking, arguing for the essentially secular Confucian background of a lot of Chinese culture. You know all that. Many of you do. Um, also listed here are the dealer Alice Bonney, whom I would come to know well in New York and Japan, and Schuyler or Kai Kamen, who taught at the University of Pennsylvania. Next, please. Uh, my old notes seen here are barely readable, but I've managed to transcribe them with difficulty for use in this lecture. Uh, reading them, as I say, with difficulty, but also with some admiration for the thoughts of this promising young scholar and his readings of the poems. Unfortunately, for reasons of time or other, only he could tell you the reasons, and he's no longer around, this young scholar spoke about only five of the ten leaves in Busson's album, so I'll have to improvise commentary on the, on the others. Of course, I mean to show all ten. Next. I should pause and give some background on the Japanese paintings that preceded these uh, early Nanga painters, uh, the great works of the Rinpa masters, such as Sotatsu and Kōrin. These are the screens by Sotatsu, representing the turbulent sea around Matsushima, that are among the treasures of the Freer Gallery. Next. But also behind them was a great ink painting tradition from the Muromachi artists before Seshu, through Seshu's great works, and those of the Japanese ink masters after Seshu, such as Hasegawa Tohaku, whose screens of pines and mist, seen here, I've already found excuses for showing several times in these lectures, since they are special favorites of mine. So how did the Japanese ink painting tradition differ from that of the Chinese? That's a subject for a whole lecture, or a book, or a series of books. There's no easy answer. Robert Treat Payne, in his part of the Payne and Soper book, The Art and Architecture of Japan, the old Pelican series book that we used for many years as a teaching text, Robert Treat Payne observed that Japanese painting tends to be decorative, Chinese painting philosophical. That observation is as good and as bad as any other observation of that kind. They, they have to be, well, they have to have their limitations, to say the least, but I used it many times in teaching. I'm certainly not going to attempt one of my own, although the problem has occupied me over many years. That is how Japanese ink painting differs from Chinese. It does, and the difference can be defined, and I've tried to do it, but not here. Okay, next. It's well known that Ike no Taiga, the other early Nanga master, learned a lot about Chinese painting from the woodblock printed manual, the Jiezuan Huajuan, or Mustard Seed Garden Manual of Painting, the first section of which on landscape painting was published in 1679 in Nanjing, and copies of it were accessible to the early Nanga masters in Japan, the next. In fact, a Japanese edition of a part of the Jiezuan had been published in Kyoto by the middle of the 18th century. This is one of several reprints of Chinese publications done there, which are ignored by students of ukiyo-e, who make a big thing out of the uh, gradual conquest of multi-block color printing by their artists, culminating in the brocade prints done in the, uh, by Harunobu school around 1765. But that's another scholarly argument that doesn't concern us here. Anyway, uh, Taiga and others were able to learn from the Jade Zuyan. Next, please. How Taiga and others imitated in brush painting the necessary conventions of woodblock printing, such as the device of printing tree foliage with a graded or shaded ink block for the main pattern with a graded color wash printed over it, how Taiga and others created a new style of painting out of this is a fascinating process to watch. I and my students once planned an exhibition of Prints into Paintings and Back Again. That was our working title. And I held a seminar on that subject. But the exhibition never took place. That is, it didn't take place at our museum. It was carried out in Japan at the Machida Print Museum near Tokyo, inspired in part by a lecture I gave there and by the participation of my student Hiro Kobayashi. That's another long story. Anyway, the painting I've been showing is one by Ikino Taiga representing the famous Red Cliff Ode theme. It's in the Freer Gallery of Art. Next. Ikino Taiga then goes on to develop, out of this unpromising beginning, a new style of his own, 
as seen in this detail. I can't seem to find the slide of the hole. This detail from a painting he did in 1749, once that I, a painting that I once owned myself. It may still be in our Berkeley Art Museum, I don't know. Done in ink and colors on silk, it represents a man crossing a bridge beneath leafy trees by a cliff. The old forms, derived from the Jezuan prints, are still used, but brilliantly turned into a new style that plays between surface and depth, between image and pattern, in a way that's ultimately Japanese. Nothing quite like this can be seen in Chinese painting. And which, for instance, in the blue pattern of the water, a flat form that still recedes into a kind of depth, uh, that draws on the Rinpa school styles of Ogata Koren and others. All this, about which I could talk on for hours, and I'd love to if I had the right slides, all this is a build-up to our looking at last at the Ju Benjugi albums by Taga and Busan, once uh, in the collection of Kawabata Yasunari, now kept in a museum named after him in Kamakura. Uh, next, please. Here is the first leaf at last of Taiga's album, titled the Ju Ben, or Ten Conveniences. The other of the pair, painted by Yosa Busan, is titled the Ju Gi, or Ten Fitnesses. Uh, they are commonly rendered uh, uh, not as fitnesses and conveniences, but as the Ten Blessings and the Ten Joys. And I'll use that uh, looser rendering in talking about them. The two albums were commissioned by a rich provincial literatus named Shimongo Khan, or Shimongo Gakkai, who lived near Nagoya. He engaged Taiga, and Taiga may have had the idea, it's not clear, of bringing in Busan to do the other album. The two artists had known each other in Kyoto, but hadn't collaborated before. This all happened in 1771, when Taiga was 49 years old and Busan uh, 56. The album is based on poems by Li Yu, or Li Li Wang, the famous Nanjing literary figure, who is also responsible for compiling and publishing the Jie Zuan, the Mustard Seed Garden, and writing a preface for it. Next. The patron, Shimogo, Shimogo Gakkai, must have suggested to Taiga that he illustrate a series of poems by Li Yu, Li Li Wang, about the pleasures of living in the country, away from the city. Or else it was Taiga who suggested this. It's not clear who. Anyway, they agreed that Taiga would do the Ten Conveniences, and Busan who was, was brought in to do the Ten Fitnesses. Li Yu's preface to the series of poems, written by Taiga on the first leaf, uh, reads as follows. Quote, The master of the Yi Garden built himself a hut of reeds at the foot of a mountain. He stopped up his gate as if taking leave of the world. A guest came by one day and said to him, uh, You have withdrawn from the crowd and live in calm and quiet. How do you manage to overcome the inconveniences of such a life? The master answered, I receive the natural blessings of mountains and water, enjoy the attentive gifts of flowers and birds. There are many comforts to be had from these. I cannot count them all. How can you speak as you just did? The guest asked him to list these comforts. And the master answered him, not realizing that he was speaking in poetry. And so it goes on, um, the, the poems. Um, now then, leaf one is the blessing of cultivating one's land. Next. In the verse written on this first leaf, Li Yu speaks of having ten acres of land in the mountains with a pond of water from which to irrigate it. Next. What I showed before of Taiga's painting, however briefly, will have prepared you in some part for what he does in this album. The row of trees with different shapes and colors, the flat pattern of the water flowing down, and the very un-Chinese brush drawing. Next. But the challenge of drawing these small pictures on paper, responding to Li Yu's poems, encourages Taiga to develop nuances of brushwork and drawing that account in some part for the great reputation that these albums have attained and also for their great appeal to me as an escape from the dictates of Chinese good brushwork. What any good Chinese connoisseur would hate is what I have come to love, in some part at least. I don't want to push that too far, but it's largely true. Next, please. 
The second leaf, also a very simple one, is entitled The Blessing of Studying Agriculture. Uh, exhausted from working in the field, our poet, farmer, relaxes in his hut. Nothing but green fields can be seen from the window. He sits at a desk, reading a textbook on farming. Now, he thinks, his scholar's skill in reading at last becomes really useful to him. Next. The hut is drawn simply, with no one seen in it. The poet is imagined there, looking out over the paddies. Taiga makes the bushes around the hut blurry by applying the ink and color uh, very wet and letting it spread on the paper. But he manages to separate the near and far and add two black trunks of trees. Next. A detail of the paddies with the growing rice or vegetables. A single blue-black blob at the right may cover up a spilled drop of ink. As for his play of colors and pattern, is anybody thinking Surah and pointillism? Right on, I think. I agree. Next. Leaf three is the blessing of fishing. Without the trouble of wearing a raincoat or a rain hat, he writes, or rowing in a boat, he can sit during the day at his eastern veranda and practice fishing for sea serpents while his guests drink wine. Next. The two guests are simply drawn, talking to each other, one with his hand raised. Taiga doesn't even draw in the outlines of their heads completely, but they are effectively characterized. Throughout the album are images of relaxation, with none of the stiffness of professional and academic painting of the time. Just that lack of finish, of, of haunted competence, got Nanga dismissed by early scholars of Japanese art, Fenelosa, for one, called it little more than a joke. Next. Fenelosa was committed to the academy, the Nihon bijutsu in, the successors to the Kano school in the Edo period, who could always be depended on for fine drawing and high finish and elevating subjects. Escaping from all that was a powerful attraction of the Nanga school, along with their charmingly naive pretense of being the scholar artists of Japan. Our learned fisherman here throws out his bait and pulls in a small fish. Next. The fourth leaf illustrates the blessing of watering the garden. Building a mud wall, our scholar recluse makes a vegetable garden near a square pond. Here it is easy to make fruit grow large or vegetables grow tall. Taga doesn't trouble to depict large fruits or tall vegetables, letting the viewer viewers imagine them. Next. To carry a large jar, the verse continues, would be foolish, and an irrigation machine too much trouble. So he waters the garden from his wine pot. His figure of the recluse is made up of small brush strokes, washes of color mixed with ink, outlines that don't continue, a high level of technique masquerading as amateurish semi-competence. Next. Nothing like it can be seen, I think, in Chinese painting even in the works of the so-called strange masters or eccentrics of the Yangzhou school, who were more or less contemporary with Taiga. The Nanga master's ignorance of all the Chinese dictates of proper ways to apply ink and colors to paper was, as I say, their salvation, permitting such amiable transgressions of proper bifa or brush method as we see here. The next, please. Leaf 5 is the blessing of drawing water. A mountain torrent passes just beneath the window of the kitchen, he writes, and a piece of bamboo draws off the water from it for his use. The water he uses to brew tea for his special guests, and it's water that still keeps the fragrance of the boulders high up above at the source of the stream. The next. This detail shows how Taiga indeed, simply but effectively, shows us the source of the water high up in the rocky heights above the recluse's dwelling, pouring forth copiously. Next. To be channeled through the length of bamboo outside his kitchen, where a servant fills a large container from it. The servant is identified as that by the animated drawing, quite different from the relaxed brushstrokes used for the literatus farmer himself and his guests, and the peanut-shaped head with funny cap. The quality of water was indeed a serious concern for tea drinkers in Japan, and even for coffee drinkers. I recall a coffee shop 
that advertised not the coffee they used, but the water drawn from a noted spring nearby. Next. The sixth leaf is the blessing of bathing. To wash off my dirt, he says, I don't have to go out to the river. Nearby is a running stream, fresh and clear. He doesn't, of course, show himself bathing. That would be vulgar. We imagine him behind the wall. Next. He writes, It's not that a recluse like myself is partial to cleanliness, meaning living by himself, whom should he bother to be clean for? But only that the waves pull at the bright tassels of my cap. This is an allusion by Li Yu to the cap and tassels of officialdom. Washing helps him forget, that is, his former life as a bureaucrat. Next. Leaf 7 is titled, The Blessing of Wood Gathering. Of taking on, that is, the role of the familiar wood gatherer, whom one sees in Chinese paintings, uh, the people who roam the mountains finding pieces of wood to carry back to the villages and cities to sell. Uh, he writes of gathering wood in autumn, picking up branches from the forest floor to store for the winter. Next. He throws down his books, abandons his studies, takes on the role of the woodcutter, or wood gatherer, rather. Just step through the gate and you're already in the mountains. You don't have to go far, he writes. Taiga's figure is again a small marvel of seemingly disjointed strokes and patches of color that pull together into a walking figure with its weight distributed, its patient forward movement somehow implicit. Next. Such a detail as this makes me want to re-experience that first viewing of the album at Kawabara's place when Nanga was new to me and exciting, a welcome departure from all that I had learned about Chinese painting and about other kinds of Japanese painting. Next. Leaf 8 is devoted to the blessing of closing up at night. No figure is shown in this leaf, but just the shut-up gate of his house. It's only, he writes, a cold and plain dwelling in a chilly village where there are no thieves. Nothing he has is worth stealing. Next. They pull up the bridge over the stream or the canal outside his gate, cutting themselves off from the dusty road, and the mountain dogs fall, fall fast asleep among the roots of the old trees, he writes. Next. The ninth leaf, one of those most often reproduced and admired, is the blessing of composing poems. Both windows open onto the mountain, he writes. I sit without thought. I don't go forth to find a poem. The poem comes to me. Next. The drawing, however simple and amateurish looking, conveys effectively the far distance between the foreground figure and the distant mountains that he is gazing at. Even the fine, continuous outlining of the window, window shutter and the frame separate them visually from the blurry, far distance. Next. The figure is another small marvel of almost random-looking brushstrokes and washes that depict but also characterize this figure. No one, he writes, think it strange that my purse is empty. I am rich in rhymes. It is only because I dwell in my own small paradise. Next. And our gaze, too, is drawn into the far distance, losing itself there, in the almost formless poetic mode that charges the figure's mind. Next. The tenth and last leaf in the Ju Ben album represents the blessing of gazing. The poet writes rather mysteriously, at least for me, I partly translated this in my old notes without offering any explanation, presumably I couldn't think of any. He writes, I drive away goats from the cave on Red Pine Mountain. What that's about, I don't know. In one day, the pupils of my eyes go forth and return many times. I have never exhausted the exhilaration of this thousand-mile traveling. Clouds fly past and embrace the whole firmament. Next. Again, the distance between the foreground figure and the distant mountains is well transmitted, with no show of technique. He leaves a bit of space, for instance, just in front of the figure. Color here is muted, kept within a cool range. Next. In my old notes, I comment finally, quote, while the poems are, in a sense, only the stimuli for the pictures, the pictures are not mere illustrations, Yet the union of mood in the two is hard to match in Far Eastern or any other art. A perfect meeting of minds. 
end quote. And that still seems to be true to me, a mysterious coming together of poet and painter separated in time and space, belonging to different cultures on strikingly different levels of technical attainment within their particular arts. I mean to have a lecture eventually on how mysterious comings together, unpredictable and seemingly chance convergences of people and things and circumstances, can produce great works of art. And this album belongs in that lecture. So, enough for the Jew Ben album. Now on to the to Yosa Busan and the Jew Gi, or Ten Fitnesses, next. But before I go on to Busan's album, I'll take the time to do something radical and wrong. I'm going to show, while I tell a story, the ten leaves of Taiga's album again, each beside one of the leaves from the album of Orthodox School Landscapes by Wang Jian, which I showed in uh, Gazing Into the Past uh, number four, the one on the early Orthodox School Masters of China and their contemporary, the late Ming artist Xiao Mi. The Wang Jian album is one that I own myself, received in a trade from C.C. C. Wang, and I treasured it for many years before finally parting with it not long ago. It can be taken to represent, I think, orthodox school landscape painting at its strongest. All right, here is the story. Sometime in the late 1960s or early 70s, I can't quickly come up with the exact date, I held a graduate seminar with some of my best students, Pat Berger and Marshall Widener were still among them, I remember, to coincide with a major event at Princeton in New York, Wen Fong's acquisition of orthodox school paintings for the collector Earl Morse. Uh, his collection was presented in a very important symposium at Princeton on orthodox school painting under the title Artists and Traditions, colon, Uses of the Past in Chinese Culture. I gave a paper in it titled The Orthodox Movement in Early Qing Painting, which was published in the volume devoted to that exhibition and symposium. The volume edited by Christian Merck that finally came out in 1976. My seminar to get back to that was on Chinese Orthodox, Orthodox school painting. And I remember a climactic moment when I was able to show them, uh, the students that is, I had, I had it briefly in my possession conveying it to C.C. Wong in San Francisco to show them the great hand scroll by Wang Yuan Chi representing the Wang Chuan Villa theme, a work that I discuss at length at the beginning of the last chapter of my con compelling image book and you can see reproductions of it there. Anyway, I had also just then purchased a very fine Ikeno Taiga painting for my stepfather, George Schlenker, from Yabumoto Sogoro, uh, the uh, wonderful dealer in uh, lived near Osaka. Uh, and it was a representation of the Wanting or cup floating scene. And I was taking this to our University Art Museum for storage. And I unpacked that and showed it to my seminar. And their response was disbelief and horror. How can you possibly be buying such an awful painting, Professor Cahill? A painting with no brushwork, a vulgar theme and composition. They were seeing through the Chinese Orthodox master's eyes. And through those eyes, it was indeed an awful painting, not worth owning. I could have done the same in reverse, though I don't recall doing it, by showing some fine Orthodox school painting to my students in a Nanga seminar. They would have responded similarly. How can you want to own such a dull, lifeless painting without the entertaining subjects and lively figures of the paintings that we've been looking at? A person's eyes can be tuned, so to speak, to seeing in a certain way, just as his or her ears can be tuned to appreciate certain kinds of music or certain nuances in performance, the voice of the singer, the special sounds produced by a certain violinist, such as Joseph Segetti, who's playing at one point in my life I could tell instantly when any one of his many record, uh, recordings was played. Well, this is a matter somewhat apart from would-be objective judgments of quality, but it has to be taken into account when we attempt such judgments or try to evaluate and respond to judgments made by others. So I hope I've made my point, an important one for me, and I should think for many of you. And we'll now return to our main subject and look at the Jugi album by Yosa Busan. Next, please. 
But again, I want to begin by introducing the artist, Busson, who really has occupied me more in my scholarship and writing than Taiga. Uh, he was a great poet painter, a master of haiku composition, He's following the great, his great predecessor, Matsuo Basho, 1644 to 1694. Uh, whom Busson revered, his life and his writings, notably his Narrow Road to the Deep North, Oku no Hosomichi, known to all students of Japanese literature, uh, composed in 1694. Busson copied and illustrated this masterwork in a famous pair of screens, a pair of screens from which I also have several details. Busson practiced, that is, the very special Japanese art form of haiga, painting done to accompany haiku poems, uh, so that the artist who does them is really practicing three arts, painting, calligraphy, and haiku composition. Next, please. Living for years in Berkeley and working toward a doctorate in Japanese art and language under my supervision at a time when we had no proper Japanese art specialist was a remarkable Greek woman named Claire Papapavlou. Uh, this is a photograph of her and others. She's the central figure. I recently heard from her again when a book by her with essays about Chinese and Japanese culture was finally published. She came to Berkeley and UC Berkeley with a background in Greek archaeology and worked tirelessly and with little attention from me over quite a few years, finally completing a dissertation on Busan's great Okonohosomichi screens and receiving her doctorate. She returned to Greece to find that they had no academic position for a specialist in Japanese and Chinese art, and she has endured a sad failure of proper recognition during the succeeding decades, until, as I say, very recently. Next. I will put on screen, with its details, a great Busan painting titled Cuckoo in Flight Over New Verdure, painted in ink and colors on silk and about 164 centimeters in height. It's in a private collection in Tokyo and it's number 26 in my old Nanga catalog. I want to relate a story with a bad ending, a project that I, along with Professor Mary Beth Graybill, while she was teaching in Berkeley as our Japanese art specialist. She's now a curator at the Portland Art Museum, or was, she may have retired. Anyway, she and I held a joint seminar uh, at, at UC Berkeley on Busan for a great group of students. Um, hers and mine, she taking on the Haiga or Japanese side of Busan, the, and I the Nanga or Chinese side, Ch or Chinese derived side. I, both, I use both terms very broadly. This seminar on our research was supposed to culminate in a great Busan exhibition, the greatest ever, with all respect to several held in Japan. It would be shown at, at our University Art Museum and later at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which had taken it into their program. We had to get a Japanese museum to show it first in Japan and to assemble all the works for us from the various owners. And to make the long, sad story short, we arrived in Japan, Mary Beth and I, full of hope to talk with the museum we thought was taking it, to learn that they weren't, after all. They decided not to. And we went around to various places, talking with other museum people. Suzuki Susumu, who was then heading a museum in Tokyo, said no. Suzuki K, who had become director of a major museum elsewhere, and we traveled to see him, and I remember being with Mary Beth in his office, and he said no. Everywhere we got the same response. Sorry, we've decided that we cannot take it on. I believe that behind our failure was the opposition of a certain member of the Bunkocho, the Commission for the Protection of Cultural Properties, who was understandably miffed about something I myself had done, which is recounted on my website as Reminiscence Number 35, The Great Busan Caper. I had acquired and trade a major Busan landscape that I knew could not be exported, but once they stopped it, the Bunkocho was forced to purchase it for one of the national museums. It's now in Kyoto for a big price. I didn't take the money, but I received from the dealer who was representing me two major paintings, the horizontal painting of grapes by Ruguan, which is now in our Berkeley Art Museum, and a wonderful painting by Busan that was little known and exportable. I owned this and loved it for many years, meaning to keep it forever. But I unwisely agreed to a dealer's proposal that she show it at an art fair, 
where she sold it for far less than I thought we had agreed on. A sad story that I don't want to tell here anyway. The news of the failure of our great Busan exhibition, Mary Beth Graybills and Mind, in Japan, the news of this failure, the blocking of it by the Bunkacho person, quickly spread around Japanese art circles while we were still there, uh, taking the form of So, the famous Keihiru, my Japanese name, Keihil, So, the famous Keihiru has finally got his comeuppance. I had watched the same happen to Shimada years before. And that pretty much ended my years of vigorous participation in Japanese art circles and my productive engagement with one of their major schools of painting, the Nanga School, to which I have been able to contribute usefully as a Chinese painting specialist. And that's all recounted at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, now back to Busan. Okay, next please. My engagement with Busan produced several pieces of writing, notably a symposium paper on his derivations from Chinese painting over his long career, and a long lecture, or lecture chapter really, on him. This is the third part of my Lyric Journey book. In this, I recapitulate the account of early Nanga painting, which is sketched in here, and I go on for a long and detailed treatment of Busan's landscape with figure paintings, chiefly, with many examples. I will devote at least one lecture in this series to Busan, if I am able. I'm going to show now a landscape that he painted in 1771, with a waterfall pouring down from the mountains at the top, also a road leading down to the occupied area at the bottom, where it runs past a group of houses among trees and over a bridge. Next, please. Busan's paintings also include some devoted to sensitive scenes of interaction between people and animals. This one of a farmer feeding a horse between two thatched houses, watched by a crow in a tree, a favorite subject of Busan's, or next. This one of a similar subject, a man bringing a bucket of oats, or some other feed to the horse, which strains its neck around from the opening of its stall in its eagerness. Next. But enough of preliminaries, on to the Jugi album. The first leaf of the Jugi Cho is The Joy of Spring, and it's the first of four leaves devoted to the four seasons of the year. Li Yu's poem inscribed on it has much the same kind of whimsical character as the Ju Ben poems, which I cited. My square pond, he writes, doesn't venture to copy the West Lake. That's the great man-made lake at Hangzhou. But it has hundreds of peach and willow trees growing luxuriantly. All it lacks are the large outing boats carrying singing and dancing girls. But, he says, the scenery otherwise is not so very different. Next. Busan responds to the poem only minimally. His picture is much more an evocation of spring scenery than an illustration to Li Yu's quatrain. And unlike Taiga, he offers nothing of the anecdotal. We see immediately that he is, his series will be very different from Taiga's. Next. So which do we prefer? Meiji period writers preferred Taiga's paintings, and scarcely noticed Busan's. Kawabata Yasunari is said to have had a particular fondness for Busan's paintings. I quote this from a written source. We didn't talk about this. I should have asked him. I myself, as I said before, have devoted more time and study to Busan, but I won't express a preference between these two albums, leaving it open for all of you viewers to make your own choices. Next. The second Jugi leaf is The Joy of Summer. My room, he writes, is closed in and shaded on all sides by green trees. The blazing heat of summer is not permitted near my mountain house. The days are long. I lie at ease on my pillow, gazing at the flowers on the water, forgetting to go to sleep. Next. This one is more like Taiga's in that it includes the image of the old recluse at his window. He resembles enough the representations of him in Taiga's leaves to make us wonder whether Busan saw Taiga's leaves before painting his own. I don't know of any source that would tell us that. Next. But his painting of the leafy trees with differences in color and tone that give variety but also depth to the grove is more the Busan we know from such paintings as the cuckoo above new greenery that I showed. Next. He is painting in much smaller size and on paper here and he makes some concession to the model and mode that Taiga has set for him. 
but his own extreme sensitivity to natural scenery comes through. Next. Leaf tree is the joy of autumn. Outside my gate from time to time, Li Yu writes, I put up an embroidered screen. A thousand autumns will not bring back the greenery of the past. When I finish watering, I drink a cup of Jungyang wine. If I get drunk in the autumn mountains, I may never be sober again. Next. Here again, Busan the poet and lover of nature gives us more of pictorial depth. His picture opens in the lower le left corner with the space outside his gate and the path worn by walking leading through it. Mercifully, he makes no attempt to imagine the embroidered screen set up there, as Taiga might have. Next. Busan's inclusion of the two similar groups of red leaf trees, near and far, with the house mostly set between them and hills looming beyond, is again the work of an artist deeply devoted to the transient appearances of natural scenery. The same is true of the passage from the nearest hill to the distant ones. Next. The worn top of the earthen wall, shown with dry brush drawing, is sensitively conveyed, and the play of cool and warm colors is masterly. His signature, reading Sha Sunse, belongs to a particular period of his life, but I won't get into the complex problem of Busson signatures next. For the fourth leaf, The Joy of Winter, I have only an image made from a reproduction, and I didn't include it in my old lecture for whatever reason, so I'll show it only briefly. The landscape form at middle left, with rounded flat top, reveals a study of Chinese landscape paintings in the originals, as does his painting of the simple houses beneath trees, and the whole build-up of brushstrokes for textured surfaces, we may be reminded of Huang Gong Wang, whose original works, of course, could not be seen in Japan, but some derivatives must have been accessible to Busan. Next. The fifth Jugi leaf, The Joy of Dawn, was included in my old lecture, but my side of it has disappeared, so I can only show it in this image, another made from a reproduction. This is especially unfortunate because a good slide in details would have revealed a lot more about this extraordinary painting, in which Busan responds with unusual fidelity to Li Yu's poem, throwing open my window, the Chinese poet writes, and gazing far out of the blue clouds, I see how well the nearby water and the buildings take the early morning. I needn't look into the pond to see the color of the sun, for the pattern of its ripples appears on a wall. A really good slide and detail would have revealed, as this image doesn't, the subtlety of tone and coloring that Busan imparts to this extraordinary image of morning sunlight reflected from the rippling surface of the water and cast onto the plastered wall of his house. But Busan was never afraid to take on the representation of such transient effects of light and reflection. I think of what I can't show you, his painting of a night scene with the main light coming from a lantern held by a fisherman. Next, please. Leaf six is The Joy of Dusk, and it's another that includes the figure of the poet seen at his window looking out at us, not at the half-moon seen in the sky at right, near the tall pointed peak. The only touch of warm color is on his face and chest. Cool bluish washes are laid over the ink drawing of the remainder, conveying nicely the feeling of dusk, of a darkening sky, and the moon coming out. None of Taiga's figures look out at us, this one of Busson's does, as the one in his summer leaf almost does. Next. Leaf seven is The Joy of Clearing Sky. The poem again mentions water pouring down from high in the mountains and contains a reference or quotation from Wang, Wang Mao Jie or Wang Wei, the great Tong painter poet. In another life, I would have attempted a translation of it for you, but I'm past all that and I won't try. Next. The eighth leaf is The Joy of Wind and it's another of which I don't have an original side, unfortunately, although I did include it in my old lecture. Birds return to the fragrant trees, the poet writes. Butterflies hover by the wall. Flowers trade fragrances with other neighboring flowers. Tired of listening to the wind in the pines by the lake, I stare at the surface of the water, where the remaining red, probably the red of the sunset, I think he means, 
where the remaining red on the ripples makes sentences to read. The picture is another in which the poet is seen in his house looking out. The sense of wind is caught in the instability of all the natural forms. Busson, for some reason, adds the date to his inscription on this leaf, a psychical year corresponding to 1771 in the Western calendar. Next. Leaf 9 is the joy of darkening skies, and it's an especially sensitive evocation of that theme. In the sky is seen over the village in middle right, shown only as rooftops. One may be reminded of Busson's great painting of a snowy night over the city of Kyoto. Again, his knowledge of Chinese landscape painting style is evident in the repeated horizontal strokes, the band of fog, the smooth fusion of murky sky and landscape forms eroded by atmosphere. One may question whether Taiga could have painted such a picture. His strengths were elsewhere. Next. The tenth and last leaf is the joy of rain, and it's another poet-artist response to an atmospheric condition, the band of fog around the base of the mountain, which Busan must have learned from works by the Ming masters, the gushing stream of rainwater that pours out of this into the lower right, and, we noticed only after gazing at this leaf for a while, the thatched roof Tingzi beside it. The sense of wind and rain in the trees is masterly. Well, so much for the Jugi Cho, a lovable small work by Yosa Busan, which I associate with my early student days in Japan, my friendship with Kawabata Yasunari, and my pursuit later in my career of the very special pleasures that this great poet painter offers. Now on to the last of these three great Nangam albums that this lecture is about, the Mata Mata Ichiraku Jo, or yet again one more pleasure album by the later Nanga artist Tanomura Chikuden. But I'll proceed it again with another brief passage of autobiography. Next, please. After my move to Berkeley in the mid-60s, I continued to spend lots of time in Japan, living in the small ryokan, or Japanese inn, while in Tokyo, that was located near the dealer Ryu Sendo, which the building scene left. A good friend and colleague was Tsuji Nobuo, with whom I'm seen in the photo at right. Uh, he arranged for me to present my research at meetings of the Nihon Bijusushi Gakkai, their art historic organization, and we traveled together to see collections. We had one great trip in the Tohoku area from Sendai to various collections up there. Next, please. I took on the role of representing the Kiyoshi Kojin Temple and its old Bishop Sakamoto Kojo on his mission to propagate the greatness of Tomioka Tessai around the world. Uh, I was helping him to arrange exhibitions. Uh, that's another long story to be told another time. Next, please. Here I am at the temple in 1959 with, second from left, Terukazu Akiyama, who was writing the book on Japanese painting for the Skiro series while I was doing the one on Chinese painting. We traveled around Japan together with the photographer Henry Bevel, who's seen second from right. Uh, the two people with us are Sakamoto Kojo, the old bishop, and the young bishop, his adopted son, Koso. Next, please. Here I am with my family, Dorothy and Nicholas and Sarah, at the temple. I think it was in 1973. The group photo that I showed at the beginning uh, with Masao Ishizawa at the Yamato Bunkakan was made around the same time. I spent that year working on the pioneer early Nanga artist Sakaki Hyaksen, who will be the subject of a lecture for, uh, in himself, so I won't talk about him here. And now, next. But this is the way I prefer to remember myself in that period, comfortable in Japan, moving around freely, seeing lots of paintings, acquiring some, doing a lot of research and writing, including work on later Nanga artists. And so, back to Chikuden. Next. Chikuden belongs to the later period of Nanga than the other two. His birth and death dates are 1777 to 1835. And he is, on the whole, a more cautious, less bold master than Busan and Taiga were. Born into a family of physicians to a clan located in northern Kyushu, he received a standard Confucian education 
but he broke with the clan and became an independent literatus, living by his scholarship and painting. In 1829, Chukudan painted one of his most famous and successful works, a hanging scroll titled A Boat Trip on the Inangawa. The Inangawa is a river. Chukawa means river. Chikudan and his friend Rai Sanyo were staying with a rich sake maker near Itami, and Chikudan did this picture for their host as a parting gift. Next. It may be Chikudan himself and his host, or maybe Rai Sanyo, who appear in boats near the shore at the bottom of the painting, fishing, but also turning toward one another as if talking. Next. Further up is a large boat pulled by a boatman. This probably is a ferry, or a boat that carries things. Anyway, already we can see the remarkable cool harmonies of color that Chikudan creates in his Passages of Foliage. Next. His figure drawing, as seen in the boatman close-up, is more technically accomplished than that of either of the earlier artists. By his time, more access to Chinese paintings was available, and he learned partly from those. Next. Moving upward and leftward, we see houses through the trees, one of them with an open window, and a figure seen through it. Chikudin's treatment of trees and their foliage belongs more in the tradition of Busan, creating visually engrossing patterns with sharply drawn trunks and branches set against the large areas of blue-green foliage. Next. Moving in closer, we see that the figure in the house is sitting at his desk and reading a book from a pile of books beside him, or before him. Uh, he's obviously a scholar, perhaps the host or one of his family. A glimpse into the kitchen below reveals a tea kettle and something hanging on the wall. Next. Further up and to the left is a simple plank bridge, and a farmer walking across it, carrying his scythe over his shoulder, and leading on a rope his ox, which wades through the water below him. Next. Above, the river divides into channels and merges with areas of fog. The pale, bluish coloring on the water harmonizes with the coloring of the foliage for an all-over cool effect. Next. Still further up, more houses, another bridge, some bare trees. Here, too, water and fog merge beyond distinction. Next. And finally, another close-in detail of the foliage. We are seeing the work of another master with a nice balance of poetic imagination and technical prowess. And I trust that this introduction has made you eager to see his album, to which we now turn. Next. And let me begin our looking at that by acknowledging that my treatment of it will be brief and incomplete. I don't have slides of all the leaves. Some of them have disappeared, or at least the full views of all of them and I don't have translations of the poems on them. You'll find a few paragraphs on this album in my Nanga catalog, in which it was number 50. The English title of the album used there, yet again one more pleasure, is my own somewhat facetious rendering of the Japanese title, which is Mata Mata Ichiraku Jo, literally, Again Again One Pleasure album. Uh, my English title seems to have been adopted by others as I see in website entries. Uh, notably, one of them for a master's thesis on this album was written by Pauline Ota, a UC Riverside student, unknown to me, but working under my former student, Ginger Shu. Uh, Ms. Ota's thesis would no doubt include translations of all the poems and lots more information, but I haven't been able to access it. Next. On screen is an image not of the whole, but a part of the first leaf titled White Clouds Rising from a Mountain Cave. Pine trees and red leaf bushes on the shore, the white cloud coming in from an unseen cave, swirling water, two figures sitting under the pines in the lower left, one of them pointing to the cloud. This is a convention that Chikuden has picked up from Chinese paintings. You remember people looking at a waterfall, one is pointing to it as if to show it to the other one. Uh, since I have a better image with the detail of the second leaf, I'll put that one on while I'm talking more about the album as a whole. Next. Uh, the second leaf, titled Boating on a Moonlit Night, is one of the finest. 
and one that I reproduced in my catalog. Our poet sits in his boat between bunches of rushes, playing a flute and gazing at a reflection of the moon near him on the water surface. Each of the poems ends, this is yet again one more pleasure. Kore wa mara, mara ichiraku. The story of how the album was created and its later history are entertaining in themselves. Chikudan originally painted ten leaves, the landscapes of figures, as a gift for an Osaka doctor named Matsushita Suiko. Uh, he gave it to his friend Rai Sanyo, who was himself a sometime painter, but better known as a scholar and calligrapher. Rai Sanyo was the subject of my student Yoko Woodson's doctoral dissertation. Uh, he gave him this album, Rai Sanyo, asking him to add a colophon leaf, an inscription leaf. And what happened next is related by Rai Sanyo himself in a postscript to that leaf. But let me put on leaf three, titled Living in Retirement, while I continue the story. Next, please. This is the leaf titled Living in Retirement, and, it's, and eventually it's detail. Rai Sanyo wrote, Kun Yi, the Chikudin, uh, brought me this album asking for a colophon. I put it in my desk, taking it out from time to time to leaf through, and I came to realize how lovable it is. In the end, I have decided to take it by force and make it mine. This is yet again one more pleasure. Uh, end quote. Chikuden, caught by this extension of his own idea, but also moved by the affection and gratitude that he felt towards Sanyo, gave it to him. In the following year, he added three more leaves, flower paintings, and also wrote six more leaves of calligraphy, giving his own account of the whole affair. He painted a different album to give to the original planned recipient, Matsushita Suiko. Next. The fourth leaf is Conversing with a Friend. On a windy and rainy night, he writes, he doesn't go out, but shuts his door and sits talking with a friend, getting tipsy, looking out and laughing. This is indeed yet one more pleasure. Next. In the detail, we see him and his friend at the window, talking and looking out, drinking wine served by a servant with a tray. Through another window below, we see his wife, presumably, and a figure seen from the back with two tufts of hair, perhaps a son. Notice how Chikuden creates space inside the rooms by showing part of the opposite wall through each window. Next. A detail of the distant scenery above reveals how Chikuden, like Busan, is a master of rendering space, atmosphere, sensuous surfaces, cloudy skies, the softening of the edges of forms with blurry brushwork and the blurring of the tree grove are proto-impressionist techniques that Chikuden uses as if effortlessly. A distant pagoda indicates the presence of a temple beyond the trees. Next. Leaf five is relaxing in a small boat, and it shows us just that. Our poet, alone in a boat, no boatman is visible, just offshore, gazing back at three autumnal trees growing on the marshy shore. Leafage adheres to the trees only along the trunks, part way up. There must be some natural basis for showing them this way, but I can't explain it. Next. The sixth leaf is titled in Ms. Ota's listing as Household Harmony, but I don't know where that title comes from. The long poem is more about a harmony of minds uh, with an old friend who visits him. The opening lines identify the season as the fourth month in spring, a day of clearing after rain. The Tung or Wutung trees are putting forth leaves. The bamboo grows tall, green moss and shade. Next. And they sit and talk in his open porch over the water, drinking some wine, becoming a bit tipsy, talking of old times, perhaps about the connoisseurship of old works of calligraphy and painting. The drawing in this leaf is relatively rough, not sharp and fine, but it conveys the feeling he wants to transmit, the scenery as viewed by the tipsy poet along with his poem. Next. Leaf seven, the last of the figures in landscape leaves, which are for me the outstanding leaves of the album, is another boating scene, this one titled Boating in a Favorable Wind. 
From the poem, we learn that our poet is traveling a long distance and depends on the favorable wind to propel him to his destination. The next. The drawing of waves on the water to indicate wind is done around the boat and also near the shore. The boat's sail is indeed filled with wind. Our poet is seen in the boat along with his friend, the two of them drinking wine and talking. The boatmen are in the smaller enclosure at the stern of the boat. Next. The single leafy tree, also blown by the strong wind, is broadly drawn, as it might be seen from the boat as they pass it. Chikuden must have traveled by boat often between the Kansai region, Kyoto, Osaka, and his old home in northern Kyushu, where he and Rai Sanyo still had family ties and patrons. I should have got my old student Yoko Woodson's dissertation or talked with her to add to what I myself could say. I'm going to see her soon, but anyway, too late for this lecture. Next. I don't have an image of the eighth leaf, which is titled Standing and Holding a Sake Cup. You'll have to imagine it. This is the ninth, titled Forgetting Oneself While Sleeping. Next. Our poet lies on a banana leaf, resting his head on his hand, smiling while asleep, his shirt or pajamas open to expose his belly button. This and the following leaf, and probably the eighth that I don't have, seem to have been painted more quickly, perhaps to finish off the album as Chikuden originally planned it, for delivery to his planned recipient, Matsushita Suiko. Next. The tenth leaf is another simple figure picture, titled, Admiring an Ancient Treasured Sword, and showing our poet doing just that. Next. The connoisseurship of old swords was, of course, an expected attribute of a cultivated clansman in Edo period Japan, and it had no connotations of a militaristic or other quirky trait of character. But as a good Berkeley liberal, uncomfortable with that subject, I have nothing to say about it, and I will turn to the final leaves. Next. These three, added for Rai Sanyo, are all of flowering plants and all are of traditional subjects painted by scholar artists in China. One could learn to paint them from the later parts of the Jeju Yuan, the Mustard Seed Garden Manual. Uh, these are, for me, okay as paintings, but not especially interesting, since they reveal little more than Chikuden's ability to follow the old rules in painting these subjects for his friend, meaning them, I suppose, to symbolize that friend's virtues. Next. Lan Hua, the Chinese orchid, had all kinds of symbolic indications, which I won't go into here. Specialists in depicting them uh, had established the basic imagery, and everybody else followed forever after, following the simple brushwork conventions that you used in painting a Chinese orchid. Next. Now with leaf 12, the famous peony, we come to the leaf that is most popular among the Japanese public and the one I hate. How can one hate such a lovely picture of a peony? You will wonder. Answer, exactly, because it's the leaf that the great general public always wanted to see. I would learn that the album was on exhibition and travel to see it. It's mounted in the Japanese album form with the leaves glued together so that only one can be exhibited at a time. Chinese albums are simply put together with spots of paste in the corners and they can be easily separated so that all the leaves can be spread out in a case. Much better uh, system. But not this one. Uh, so I would arrive and find people clustering around, gazing at, at this dumb peony again. Frustration. It's like the crowds who gather before the Mona Lisa to marvel at her enigmatic smile, the feature that accounts for the work's greatness in the popular mind. Next, please. So what can I say? Here it is. Enjoy it, but I hope that the really discerning among you would much rather look at another of Chikuden's landscapes with figures, the leaves that really exhibit his strong features and qualities that won't, one won't find elsewhere, not so the peony. Okay, enough of that. Next, please. The 13th and last leaf. I don't have images of any of the calligraphy pages, the title, or the colophones. The thirteenth and last leaf is a picture done in ink only of two flowering plants of early spring, 
the blossoming plum of the narcissus. This is more interesting as a picture, the fine line drawing of the narcissus growing from bulbs, the rougher brushwork of the old plum branches, but again, I have nothing to say about it. I could spend time reading the long inscription, but I won't. Instead, I will make this the last image uh, in this very long lecture. I hope that there have been enough of the strikingly new and original in it to persuade those of you unfamiliar with Japanese nanga painting that I was justified in devoting a big part of my career to it, and especially that the three artists who painted our three albums are among the ones who merit a lot of attention and uh, admiration in East Asian and indeed in world art. So I end this lecture, uh, which I be as I began it, by saying this won't by any means be the last one on Japanese nanga painting.